verse 23, where you can write that down. And when you get home, you can read it and you can see where God is leading us. Because everything that we preach is, is, is actually a preaching to myself and it's a preaching to you. God brings you here so you can hear his word, his voice. Me, this pastor right here, I'm just a vessel from God. God uses me to speak a word. Your job is to receive that word and then put the word to use. Not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. Hallelujah. So that means today you're going to write down the word of God. And you're not going to just write it. So okay, now I need to go to the word of God. I need to receive it. Sometimes you go, you're at home, you read the Bible and you're like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to read? And you open your Bible. Uh, <laughs> and it's not even like that. It's what God has told you. So we want you to receive this word and say, okay, now I got to go back and study it a little bit. So it all started a month ago about in the book of Exodus 34, verse 23. Where the Lord invites all the men three times in a year. He invites men to come to this conference. And the reason God calls these men to come to a conference is so he can fellowship with them, so he can connect with them, so he can uh, instruct them on how to go and work, what to do. And it talks about different, uh, different names of the Lord. It talks about God. And it talks about uh, the Lord. And, the, and we, we explain to each and every one of you what the names meant. Like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, what it really meant is in the beginning, Elohim. Elohim, which is the creator, which is all power. So if you're going to write anything, you can write the word God, G-O-D, and then put power, put creator. So in the beginning, we started with God, all powerful. And then it said God in the very, in the same scripture, 34, verse 23, it, it talks about three different characters, one God. So we went from Elohim to Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh means relator. That means God is a, we have to have a relationship with God. And then it went on to Aldenai. Aldenai is the manager. He's the one that tells you what to do. A lot of people want El a lot of people want Elohim. They want the power, but they don't want Yahweh. They don't want the relationship. And then Adonai is the one that gives you instructions. Okay, do this. Whoa, don't do that. Hold up, don't do this. And that's where we mess up a lot of times because we want the power, but we don't want the instructions and we don't want the relationship. So we started off back. Then about a month ago, God had us there uh, where God invited Israel to come to a fellowship. And the purpose was to come to have a connection with the Lord. That's why you're here. To have a connection with the Lord, to receive the love, to receive instruction, and actually receive his power. And the most important thing is a covenant, which is relationship. A covenant is a covering. All right? That's a covenant. A covenant. But when you get married to somebody, that's a covenant. When you receive God and you have not only his power, but you have a relationship with them, and you're obedient to his commandments, then that's a covering. So when the rain is coming and you put your umbrella, the rain doesn't hit you. Without the umbrella, the rain hits you. The same rain that is coming down, if you, are, if you have a covering, it will hit everybody else, but it won't hit you. Amen? So I want you to understand how, how it is, how God has had you covered all this time. You might not see it. You might say, well, he had me covered. Then why did I go through what I went through? You should look at it like, man, he had me covered because if I'm still alive in 2019, then he has to have me covered. I might have not liked it, but man, he had me covered because I should have been gone a long time ago. But God covered me. I'm significant to be a child of God because of my relationship with him. Amen. And I want you to understand that a lot of people have come. A lot of people have stayed behind. A lot of people are continuing in this journey with the Lord, and some have fell off. And I'm talking about just within a month. Recently, I preached a message entitled, Brace Yourself. Brace Yourself was a very kind of popular message that really hit home to a lot of people. And Brace Yourself, I preached out that out of the book of Joshua. And I, I preached about the book of Joshua where he was at an old age at this time, and he was warning the Israelites to actually bow down not to any other God, but to God. And he was telling the Israelites, listen, don't forget who took you out of Egypt, who took you out of slavery. Allow God to speak to you here this, this evening. Don't forget where you were at once at one point. I'm talking to the believers that cried out to Jesus. Say, Father God, here I am. It could have been at the retreat. It could have been in your bathroom. It could have been after a nightclub. It could have been when you were in concert. Whatever it was, would you remember that day where you called out to God and he came to your rescue? 
Here is Joshua at an old age telling the Israelites, listen, remember God has pulled all these strongholds out of your life and he's allowed you to win all these battles and he's allowed you to, to be alive still and all these things that God is speaking to us here today. And he, and he gives you a piece of paper to write down some of the victories that you had in your life, some of the things and battles that you have fought that you thought you could have lost, but because God is with you and not against you. Because the battles on your earth belong to God, you're still alive here today. So that's why you need to write these things down. Man, listen, uh, because it's easy to complain and talk about the bad stuff. It, it's not, it's, it, it's, there's more good than bad, but it seems that there's more bad than good. So when you have a piece of paper you can write, man, I'm a blessed person. I am a blessed man. I'm better off than what I used to be. Man, I'm, I thank God that I'm not where I used to be. I might not like where I'm at right now, but I really praise the name of Jesus that I'm not hooked on drugs the way I used to be hooked on drugs. I thank God that I'm not on the streets all drunk like I used to be all drunk. I'm glad that I am where I'm at right now. So you write these things down. It doesn't have to be just the verses. Some people come and say, what scripture did he give me? Oh, any little word that comes out and say, that's for me. That's for me. Then you write it down and say, okay, thank you, Jesus, that I'm alive because he has me covered. That's one thing. Where has God has you covered? Where is another place where God told you, brace yourself. I'm reminding you of the goodness of God. God has been good to each and every one of us. And then you think, you write it down. Where has God been good to me? One day I didn't have no money, I didn't have no food. You think about stuff like that. And then something just showed up in the mail. I don't know where it came from. Or, or someone blessed you with gas. Or someone just showed up and, and God always makes a way. And, and you have to write those things down. Man, I gotta remember about the goodness of God, not the negative. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 5, you can write that down. You can you can actually read Ephesians 5, it's a good good scripture. But God says in Ephesians 5 that everything that comes out of your mouth should be nothing but blessings. Everything that comes out of your mouth, blessing, blessing, blessing. If you are a believer and you gave your life to Jesus, you are too blessed to be stressed. You should, be, you should be not complaining, even if it hurts, even if it doesn't feel good. Because you serve God and you complain, other people hear you, what does that say about your God? And the devil's like, look at you, I thought you served the mighty God. I thought you served the God that came to your rescue. Where is he at? So even if you hurt, even if you don't like it, even if you if you just go down to your knees and you say, you know what, I'm just on the ground and going down. And then you, you say, you, you laugh and you count it on joy and say, man, praise God that I hit the ground because... Me hitting the ground, it just gave me no, no other option but just to look up to the heaven for where my help comes from. Praise the name of Jesus. And then we talked about this past Sunday, the message was entitled, Block It Out. B-L-O-T. Blot it out means destroy it. Destroy it, blot it out. This is where Moses goes up in the hill. This is where the Israelites are crying and complaining. Why don't you write things down what you complained to God already? from begin from this morning or you don't want to write that down whoa hold on you can write in the back if you want things that we complain about man i can't believe this uh, my roof is leaking well praise god that you even have a roof amen i gotta take a bus praise god that you got legs and you can take a bus you, you understand what i'm saying you look at the positive not the negative amen oh my god my wife <laughs> thank god you got a wife i'm saying uh, <laughs> uh, Praise yourself was a message that we preached about, was a very powerful message. And it talked about Moses, where God, where God tells Moses, Moses comes and tells God, hey, listen, there's no water for the Israelites, they're complaining again. It's like God saying, man, they're complaining again, because they always complain. It was never enough. It's like, if it's not one thing, it's another thing. Some people have ever, uh, have said that before. I said it before. I was like, man, when is this going to stop? It's one thing after another after another. And instead of saying when is it going to stop, would you say, Father God, thank you for these trials and tribulations because another level is another devil. That means I'm getting closer to my blessings. I'm getting closer to my victory. And then God said, there you go. I want you to change your words so you can change your circumstances. <clears throat> change your words so you can change your world. So embrace yourself was something that, they were, that we preached about on Sunday where it said, you know what? I need, I need you to embrace yourself and I want you to blot it out. And the thing is, is God told Moses, go up in the hill. Take the staff with you. He took the staff with him, and he also took two men with him, her, and he took another gentleman by the name of Aaron. And when he took these two men, he was up there, and the Bible says, I'm just giving you a little thing, and every time he had his hands raised, so you can write this out, every time he had his hand raised, he was winning the battle down here. Joshua was in the battlefield down here, Moses was up on the hill. The Bible says that every time Moses kept his uh, hands up, up in the air, 
that the Israelites would be winning the battle down here against the Amalekites. Every time his hands would come down, the Amalekites would be actually winning and beating the Israelites. So we talked about that. And then God told Moses, listen, you need to keep your hands lifted up in order for you to win the victory. And you know what happened? He started getting tired. And I asked him the question on Sunday, have you ever fought tired? And every time you put your hands down, you, you lose it. When you lose, when you put your hands down, the situation gets worse. My wife and I, we left the church the other day, and she was like, so do we walk like this all day? I said, uh, yeah. How are we going to drive? Well, we drive by faith, not by sight. <laughs> nah. <laughs> but don't write that down. But anyway, whoa, whoa, whoa. But anyways, what, what, what I'm saying is that when you put your hands down, the situation gets worse. But thank God that Moses had a had a, a, a an Aaron and a herd by next to him that lifted up his hands when he got tired. Me and Pastor Gene, a friend of mine, were talking about it. We're talking about if if, if you have five confidants. In, that you can count five confidants in your hand, you're a blessed person. A confidant is someone you can keep it real with. It's a confidant is someone that can come by your side and tell you, hey, listen, you can't look at what looks good and, or evil and call it that it's good. You can't say that that's the right thing to do when it's really not the right thing to do. And you need a confidant that will keep it real with you, that will go into the bars where you're at and say, hey, listen, you, you came from the bar. You've been delivered from that. You need to get out of there. You don't belong there. Come over here and let's continue to praise the name of Jesus. You need a confidant that, can, that you can tell, man, I feel like giving up and he won't judge you and go and tell other people, man, did you hear that pastor or that guy said that he feels like giving up? No, you need a confidant. And I was talking to Pastor G, man, if you have four or five in your life, you're a blessed person. Four or five. So you can write down in your paper, how many confidants do you have? Who can you really, really keep it real with? I mean, besides God, who can you write it down? This is going to help you. This is really going to help you. And then you have what you call your constituents. Your constituents, you can mix them up and confuse them with your confidant. The constituents look like the confidant. They're there because of what you believe in. They're there, but they're not, you know, as soon as an opportunity arises, they will leave you in a heartbeat. Your constituents are those that you can fall in love with. And man, good person, I had a lot of constituents in my life. And then they end up leaving for whatever reason. And the pastor said, when you look at a constituent and they leave, don't get upset. You gotta just understand that they're like scaffolds. A scaffolds are the ones that are set up by the buildings to build the building. As soon as the scaffold leaves, the building still remains standing in the name of Jesus. So no matter who left your life, you look at it as a constituent and say, God, thank you for bringing him or her into my path for the season because if it wasn't for that I wouldn't be where I'm at. Some of you got left by someone that you said, I didn't even know how I'm going to survive, but thank God that they left you because if they would have never left you you wouldn't be where you're at right now. You've got to look at those that scaffold and say man, I'm still standing, I'm still surviving, I'm still breathing in the name of Jesus. And then you have your comrades. Your comrades are not there for you, they're not there with you, they don't care what you do they're just there around you to see you fail. They love to talk about you they, they, they love to see you. They love to hear how your husband is doing. He's not doing good. And then they go and tell their family, they look really good and praising God, but you should see the way they're living. Those are your comrades. You don't need that. You don't need those negativity. You need some confidence that you can keep your will real with. And most had those two men that when, when he felt like putting his hands out, he, they lifted them up and said, man, you got to keep on. And it gets tiring. I know it gets tiring lifting up your hands. It's a constant battle in this life. Following Jesus is not easy, but when you follow Jesus, when following Jesus and, and you and him together, remember I said that one person and God is like a thousand men. And anybody that comes against you shall flee. You, you, they shall flee because when they see you, they see like a thousand angels all around you. So you're not alone, man. When you fight a battle, cancer, you fight diabetes, you fight with a marriage, you fight financially, know that you're not alone. Know that you have like a thousand with you. You and God, that means God is so powerful, so great. That means that what the Word of God says, it really means what the Word of God says, that nothing's impossible with God, that all things are possible with Jesus. Amen. You have to understand that when you walk with God and you realize who your Father is, and if you and a thousand, that means that you can literally look at the devil and say, man, no weapon formed against me shall prosper in the name of Jesus. You have to understand all these things that when you brace yourself and you lift up your hands, the sign of surrender. When you lift up your hands and you surrender to God and you
you give it all to him, and he's your provider, your Jehovah Jireh, he's your, the banner of your life, he's your protector, your provision, he's your doctor, he's the love of your soul, he's your, your attorney, he's your everything. You might say, man, people tell you, man, you don't have nothing, look at you, but you can tell them, listen, I have Jesus, and as long as I got Jesus, man, I got every single thing in my life, amen? So we talk about, as long as Moses had his hands lifted up, Joshua was winning the battle down here on the field. And I said that no matter how determined they were to win the battle, because a lot of people on the earth, right here, all of us, we want to fight, fight, fight. And who we're going to win, we're going we're gonna to beat. We're going to beat them. And even if we're getting defeated or the Amalekites were winning or the Israelites were winning, I told you on Sunday, it had nothing to do with the battle down here. It had to do with everything up here. It had to do with the hands of Moses. If Moses didn't lift up that staff to heaven, listen to the words, you have to understand that there's a battle here on earth, but if you don't realize what, what is your standard, if you don't realize who is your, your God, then you will continue to fight the same battle over and over and over. But when you realize who's your standard, when you realize who's your God, then you can fight the battle down here, but you also know that you have your eyes lifted up to the heaven, your staff to heaven, that as long as you lift up the name of Jesus, you will continue to win the battle down here on earth. You can live here on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the name, that kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You don't have to wait to get to heaven to experience heaven here on earth. Because you are a child of God, you can be walking around with your head lifted up, saying, man, this is heaven, hallelujah. Look at what the Lord has done. If it hadn't been for Jesus, I wouldn't be alive right now. Look at what the Lord has done in my life. I am a blessed man. I can move my fingers. I can move my hands. Uh, I, I can breathe. I can. I woke up this morning. I'm living, living here on earth as it is in heaven. And I told you before that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But before he can kill and destroy, he has to steal your joy, steal your peace, steal your dreams, steal your hope, and all that other stuff. Why would we allow him to do that? That's what we tell the devil. Whoa, wait a minute. You can't mess with this person. Don't you know who my daddy is? Don't you know who my father is? Don't you know that God is on my side? And if God is for me, who in the world could be against me? Don't you know you're messing with the wrong person? See, when you speak those kind of words, man, those words of victory, that, that's, that's lifting up the name of Jesus. That means that you're fighting over here and yet you're tired, you're still praising God up here, no matter what. And that's not easy to keep on fighting because sometimes you want to put your hands down and say, now forget about this. And then God reminds you, hey, hold on, what do you mean forget about this? But God, you don't know all this pain that I'm going through. And God says, what are you talking about? I don't know about all this pain. I'm talking about. What are you talking about? I mean, I know a little bit about pain. Hallelujah. I sent my only begotten son to die on the cross for you so you can have everlasting life. I sent my son to die so you can live. I sent him to die so you can rejoice in the name of Jesus. Don't walk around sad. Don't walk around depressed. Don't walk around angry. Tomorrow's not even a promise. Today is the, the day of salvation. Rejoice for this is the day that the Lord has made. Don't worry about yesterday. Yesterday is gone. You can't step into your future, I always say, until you step out of your past. So you got to step into your future forget about the past. Forget about who loved, who left you. Forget about who hurt you. Forget about those doors that shut on you. Forget about that. And I know it's not easy. I told my friend that the devil doesn't have to wrap you around your legs or your arms or your hands. All he has to do is wrap around your mind. He'll mess up with you. He'll mess your mind up. And then you start thinking about crazy things and you can't sleep. And there you are walking around and man, you're, you're all upset and the devil's having this cake and he's in your dining room having cookies and coffee and, 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 and enjoying himself. And you gotta tell him, whoa, listen, and for me in my house, hallelujah, we serve the Lord. You got no authority in this house. I'm giving you notice to vacate my house right now. Because my God lives in this house. And this is something that we have to all understand. That this woe that God is saying right here, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. That's crazy because throughout this journey, man, God has warned us and warned us about the Amalekites. I told you about the Amalekites. The Amalekites are those that prevent you from getting to your promised land. The Amalekites might be someone that you have in your life that's an Amalek. It's an Amalekite. Amalek is a person that will 
actually, you should be over here, but you're still over here because there, you have someone that is dragging you and dragging you. You can't get to your destination. And you say, well, I don't want to hurt his feelings. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to let go. And God said, man, well, then you're going to be stuck. Because once you get rid of your Amalek, your Amalekite, if they don't want to go where you're going, then you need to shake them off. You, you got somewhere to go. God has a mission for you. He has a destiny for you. He wants you to get somewhere. And if you have an Amalekite hanging on you, it doesn't let you be happy, doesn't let you rejoice. You're walking around sad because of your Amalekite, because of your situation. Those are, that's an Amalek. And God warned us about Amalek. It says this, in, in the book of Joshua, Joshua says, the Lord will war against Amalek from generation to generation. How many parents are in this house? Any parents in this house? Do you have children? Any grandparents in this house? Do you have children? Well, this, this word is not just for you, but it's for everybody, but this word, you gotta take it to heart, generation to generation. Embrace the embrace the message was really tough because I talked about how the city has become a Pergamos church. Pergamos Church is a church that it speaks in the in the in Revelation, where in Greek it means gamos or gamos, G-A-M-O-S. And gamos, gamos means wedding. And if, if we talk about on Sunday that the city of San Antonio, our nation, has become a Pergamos church. It's being it's actually being married to the world instead of being married to Jesus. We need to be married to Christ, not to the world. We're not here to be a compromising church, a compromising city. We gotta tell the city and everything else to say this is right. We gotta say, whoa, it's not right. You can't call evil good, and you can't call good evil. You can't call what's actually bitter and call it sweet when it's actually bitter, not sweet. You gotta see it the way it is. You can't call a dog a cat because a cat is not a dog. And people want to call whatever they want to call, whatever they want to call. And God says, whoa. And the thing is, for each and every one of us, you can't have a part-time victory and say, you know what? I'm going to quit smoking. I, I used to smoke a uh, whole carton of cigarettes. Now I smoke uh, one pack. The Bible I talked about before, God, God told the Moses and he told Saul and he told to tell him to kill everything. But all out. Take it out of your mind, just destroy it all. Saul comes and Saul says, hey, listen, I killed it all, but I kept this good one, and I kept this. Why did you keep that for? Like a trophy? No, nah, just for sympathy, I want to keep it. And God said, no, oh, blot it all out. Like, you can't have just part-time victory, you need to have full-time victory. You understand what I'm saying? Blot it all out is something that we have to understand that when you blot it all out, that means completely. All out. Somebody say completely. Amen. So write it down. What do you have to completely blot out of your life? What is it that is holding you back? Is it alcohol? Is it drugs? Is it cocaine? Is it pornography? Is it adultery? Is it anger? Is it jealousy? Is it worriness? Is it what is it? Because all those things is not a God. Because God says, don't even worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow not even promise. So even worriness is, is something that you need to blot out. Well, how can I survive? How can I live? That's what the Bible says. You walk by faith and not by sight. You trust God. You lean on Him and not on your own understanding. The Bible says that your ways are not His ways and your thoughts are not His thoughts. The way you think is not the way God thinks. When you say, man, I'm not going to make it, God knows you're going to make it. When you say, I don't know how it's going to happen, God already knows how it's going to happen. God already knew you were going to be sitting here today. He knew that you were going to be sitting here this, this afternoon. You didn't even know where were you going to be this week from maybe a month ago, but God says, I got it all planned out. I'm going to call this to happen, this happen, this happen. And one way or another, you can run, you can't hide. And one day you'll be sitting here praising the name of Jesus. You got to write it all down. What you got to blot out? What is an Amalekite that you have in your life that maybe you need to pray for that Amalek? Might be someone that you love so much, and that Amalek is one of those individuals that just keeps you from your destiny, doesn't want nothing to do, it's, it's just evil, and it's hard, that person will never change you, you have a hard, hard heart, write his name down, write her name down, and then pray for that person, and God, I ask you that you have your way, and every knee, the Bible says, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that he is the Lord, come on, let's praise the name of Jesus, amen, amen. praise the name of Jesus, so you need to learn this word, you need to actually write it down, take notes, study it, and you need to actually get ready for this journey that we're on. The Amalekites, this Amalekite spirit, they are known as the nippers. N-I-P-P-E-R-S. Nippers. Like clippers, but nippers. It's actually a tool, like pliers. Watch this. It is used to squeeze 
or cut out the growth of development. This nippers is a tool that is used to squeeze on out or the, the growth on development. Think about it. How many times has the enemy come and he's cut, cut things out or pulled out something from your life that, is, that is not, has caused you not to grow? So how many times have you started something and you just don't finish it? And I called you for that and you didn't finish or you're not, it, it cut that growth and it, it got you too busy in the things of the world that we don't embrace God or we become like a Martha and not a Mary. A Martha is too busy and I talked about this before, but the Bible says seek you the kingdom of God first. Be a Mary, be at the feet of Jesus. If you want a miracle, you gotta be at the feet of Jesus. You can't have a full-blown victory giving God just part-time praises, coming whenever you want. No, you gotta be at his feet all the time, all right? Somebody say, whoa, whoa, that's pretty tough right there, whoa. All right, he's cutting the growth of our development. Malachi, I'm still talking about the Amalekites, is someone who takes advantage. Does anyone take advantage of you? Write it down. I mean, that's the Amalekite I need to get rid of. Ain't nobody can take advantage of me. Amen. And Amalek means warlike. W-A-R, like a war. Warlike. The Hebrew root for Amalek is A-M-A-L, like a mall. A mall. A-M. Like, like, like Marty. M. A-M-A-L. L is the root of the Hebrew word, it's amal, which means to toil, T-O-I-L. That's what it means, it means to toil. It means war, wearing, like you're wearing out. It means effect, it means pain, it means wickedness, it means sorrow. You can write some of these things down, it means trouble. That's what the word amal means in the Hebrew. Warlike, amalite, means trouble, it means wickedness. I want you to realize that the tiredness that Moses felt when he had his hands up, the tiredness he felt when he had his hands up, while he was living his hands, was not just a natural tiresome, it was actually a spiritual attack upon his life. It wasn't something in the natural, something spiritual. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. Don't get tired. Look at your neighbor tell him, don't get tired now. All right? Don't fall asleep now. This kind of like spirit will wear you down. Okay? Let to say it again. This spirit will wear you down. So you are tired, amen, spiritually. This is the Amalek spirit that's upon you. Listen, listen to this. Write it down. If you are tired, so you can write down tired something because then you need to work on that. You, you need to do something. It, 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 this spirit will wear you down. This Amalek spirit was wearing down Moses. Watch this. So that he will give up his posture of intercession. Can you imagine? Getting so tired that you lose your position. You lose your purpose. Posture means position. This is the thing that the Amalek was, was battling Moses to the point where he gets so tired. I mean, think about it. He's up in the hill with his staff. I mean, you, you can only hold it so long. To the point where he had two people come, one on the right, one on the left, to help him hold it up because he couldn't do it alone. And you need your confidants, like I said earlier. You need someone that you can trust that will come beside you and lift you up. Not someone that will drain you. Not someone that was going to take advantage of you. Not someone that is wicked. Not, you don't need an Amalek next to you. You need the Holy Spirit, hallelujah. You need Jesus by your side. You need God on your side. You need an ego on your side to help you up, to lift up your hands and say, man, we're going to do this, we're going to do it together. We're going to fight the good fight of faith. I know you feel like giving up. Sometimes I feel like giving up too, but we're going to fight the good fight. We didn't come this far to quit, my brother. Come on, stand up, shake it off. I'm here for you. Don't worry about it. Nobody's going to know nothing. We're going to fight this good fight of faith, and we're going to finish strong in the name of Jesus. You need someone like that to encourage you. You don't need someone like, man, how many times are you going to put up with that stuff? Just forget about it. Just quit. Don't even give them a second chance. Don't even uh, forget it. Church doesn't work or, or ministry doesn't work. Or the, the word of God, how many times has God said he's going to come through? Where is he at? Well, every time you ask, where is he at? You go in a big old circle and he's never going to show up because you keep on asking, where is he at? When you learn how to shut up and say, I don't know where he's at, but I know he's coming because his promises... He keeps the promise, he's a faithful God, he's the same way yesterday, today, and forever. That's the God that I serve. Hallelujah. Those are the things that we need to learn how to say. You gotta write those things down. Say, man, I gotta learn how to write those things down. Put them in my refrigerator. If you're going on a diet, that's a good word to write. Whoa! 
It's like, God's like, go, I don't want to go, I don't want to eat that. I want, I want the woe stuff. Some people like the woe stuff. The, the things that God says don't, it's what actually looks good, it feels good, it tastes good. It's, 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 it's what it leads to destruction. Amen? It's like a woman, looks good, feels good, and then it leads to destruction, or a man, or vice versa. We, do, we have to understand that we can't. Compromise. We can't be a compromising church to say, okay, it, 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 this is good when it's, it's really not good. Amen? We got we to gotta walk to these things and really not be that Pergamos church that we're married to the city, to the world, instead of being married to God. And when we're married to God, we don't compromise it. We, we're like a, like, like, a, like a Joseph. You know, Joseph, he ran. And even though he went through, he went through the pit, the palace, the prison, all that stuff, but he was a faithful man. And we gotta be those. We are. We have to be a Mary, a Mary that had the, the issue of. I uh, uh, mean, the lady with the issue of love. We gotta for twelve years. We have to actually embrace ourselves, and whatever comes in front of us, we have to get through the crowd. And as long as we can get a hold of Jesus and get healed in the name of Jesus, we, we gotta we gotta have a Philadelphia church, which is a faithful church that will stand for the truth and nothing but the truth. We can't have a, a church that is just compromising. It's okay when it's not okay. That's what the Bible says. Woe to those that call evil good and good evil. Woe those who exchange darkness for light and light for darkness. What does darkness have to do with light? Nothing. When you walk in, the, the darkness has to flee because you're the light of this world. You're the salt of this earth. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Praise God. Come on, let's give it for Jesus. I'm almost done here. I think there's just a lot of people that are experiencing this right now that you get so tired, so worried that you can only hold it for just a little bit. And then the devil knows where to mess with you. He knows what your weakness is. He knows what you like. He knows exactly where to hit you. And then you put your hands down for a moment and whoa, you lose it. That's what God's saying. Woe to those who call evil good. That you think it's okay. That it's all right. A lot of people are experiencing this right now. You're laying your hands down. You're putting your hands down. Where's your herd? Where's your Aaron? Where's the people that are going to come, call you, come to you accountable? Some people that are, that, that are in my leadership, they don't really like it because I'm, I'm all over their Facebook and I'm all over, the, it, it, I, it, I make it uh, my business because I want to make sure who I have here, uh, and who, who's, who's actually serving and, and making sure that it's none of your business will then you don't have no business being a leader here then because if you're going to be a leader here, you need accountability because I'm accountable to you, I'm accountable to God. And if, if you can't even be obedient to the one you can't see, you can't be obedient to the one you can't see. And, and, and it's accountability. That's what we teach here. We need to be accountable to each other. Amen? If you have no accountability, it's not good. And I told you on Sunday, you're like a lone ranger. And eventually you find Bongo or Tango, and then, and then you know what? Those of you that know what lone ranger is, some of you are too young to know. Long Ranger is like that with a mask. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, an Amalekite. No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> I say this. If you don't have a her or an Aaron in your life, uh, sometimes I question, we might have a, what is called a, a Nimrod. A Nimrod spirit. Write it down. Nimrod spirit. I'm almost done. If the worship keeps here, we didn't bring them up. We can finish right now. Okay. A Nimrod spirit. Uh, you will hear about the Nimrod spirit in the book of Genesis chapter 10. Just write it down. You can read it later on. The book of Genesis chapter 10, verse 8 and 9, it says that he was a mighty man. That's the first time you see it, you hear about a mighty man in the Bible. It's in the book of Genesis 10. And it's talking about Nimrod. He was a mighty man and he was a mighty hunter before Lord. What? A mighty hunter before the Lord. In other words, before means he was there and he did it before God. Like it, it doesn't mean like it's a good thing. It means like he was a mighty man before God. Like, like it was all about him. I'll tell you about the Nimrod spirit real quick. I won't take too long. He was the grandson of Noah. You know Noah, the one that built the ark? He was the son of Cush. He was the, the grandson of Noah. I mean, you think about it. When Noah came out of the boat after the, the big old hit, when the world came to an end, and then the big old flood, and Noah came out, this is, this is Nimrod that came out of it. 
and you will figure that because he's part of the family, he will do good. But if you really study Nimrod, Nimrod was a regular normal science. He's like one of those big old giants that remember when, when Moses or uh, Moses sent the spies to go spy the land for the promised land? I'm not gonna go into this Bible study thing, but remember when he sent the spies to go look at the go see the promised land? He sent 12 men, remember that? Ten men came back, said, oh no, there's a lot of big giants over there. And then two men, Caleb and Joshua, came and said, hey, listen. They look like giants, but man, listen, they're big, but our God is bigger. They saw the same thing, but they came back with a different attitude, a different, a different, a different answer. That's the difference between the relationship with God that you have. That's the difference between you knowing your power, the relationship, and who your God is. That some people can see the same thing you see, but they see it differently. They see it like they feel like grasshoppers. That's what the Bible says. Now they're big, and then two men out of twelve come. Listen. They're big, but it is good with Uncle Honey. We can take it. No, we can't. No, no, we can't take it because God is on our side. And you, you need to look at it that way. But if you have a Nimrod spirit, this Nimrod spirit is, is not, it's not a good spirit, okay? Nimrod is one who looks good, but is actually evil. Amen? It's a, it's a Nimrod spirit. They'll, they'll, they'll trick you. They'll, they'll, they'll make themselves look so good. They're sweet, like the Bible says, whoa, to those that exchange sweet but it's bitter. Whoa, Nimrod built his own kingdom, his own empire. If you think about it, if you look at his Babel, if you look at the story of Babel, and eventually he moved to Assyria. And, and if you read verse 9 and 10 of Genesis 10, uh, in go 8, 9, 10, 11, it tells you all the cities that he built. And then it, and, and it actually, when he says that he's a hunter, he's not a hunter for prey, he's a hunter for man. He uses man to build his own kingdom, okay? I wish I could really preach on this, but it's a lot, a lot of details. I could probably do this on Sunday. But this, this, this Nimrod, this Nimrod, uh, the guy that I'm talking about, he would use people to build his own kingdom. Eventually, after those, there's a lot of angels that he built these cities, and then he went into Assyria. And now this, this Assyria, the, the Assyria, A-S-S, -S, okay? Assyria means a step. Somebody say a step. Okay, so he moves into Assyria. I'm talking about Nimrod. Nimrod, Assyria, the word where he put it means a step. Okay, watch this. And, and, and a step, this is something that a person operating in the spirit of Nimrod is actually will step on, will step over, and will step through anyone to get to the place that he desires. You got it? Assyria means a step. Nimrod spirit, which is Nimrod, this is the, the, the spirit. If you have someone like that, or maybe I hope that that's not you, but the Nimrod spirit, no matter what, what happens, this person will step on, will step over, or step through anyone just to get to the place that he desires. Right. We don't want that around us, but it's about them when it's really about Jesus. It's not about you. Tell your neighbor, it's not about you, neighbor. It's about Jesus, amen? Come on, tell them, don't get mad. Don't step on me, don't step on me. Tell them, whoa! Whoa, whoa, trying to hit me. Amen? <laughs> Everybody with me? I'm almost done. This spirit is actually means, it's, it's actually like a rebellious attitude. Anyone know anyone with a rebellious attitude? Yes? Anybody next to you that you don't want to raise your hand because they're right next to you? <laughs> Terco. Let me say this in Spanish. Anyone know that there's someone that is Terco, Necia? Those are all Hebrew words. <laughs> Terco, Terca, Necia, Necios, some pesados, pesadas, some pontadas. Am I getting to it? Anybody? Little by little, see all the hands. If you say it that one, I didn't know that's what it meant. <laughs> that's what a Nimrod spirit is. They're rebellious, they're nesting, but they never learn. It's just one thing after another. I'm going to do it my way, just the way it is, and that's it. I'm going to do whatever I think. I'm going to step over it, step on it, take over. It's going to be my way or the highway, like, like you're black and burger thing. Like, I'm going to have it my way, whatever. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This fruit has a rebellious, rebellious attitude. And not only has a rebellious attitude, but it has a rebellious action. It actually does things that it's just equal. <laughs> Woo! 
You ever hear like that? Some of you gave your mom and your dad that kind of like headache. <laughs> My mom says, hey, thank God he's a pastor now. Because <laughs> I was one of those Simrocks. I was stopped this out. But uh, praise the name of Jesus. Praise God. You like the way the Mexicans do it like, pero, you know, thank you. Or they use the word, basically, uh, <laughs> they don't even know what the word means. Ah, uh, everything's basically uh, what I'm trying to say. Let me, let me move on. Okay, so the spirit, <laughs> this is a rebellious spirit, okay? It's a rebellious attitude. A person with a Nimrod spirit, watch this. A person with a, uh, with a Nimrod spirit will skillfully mix holy with the profane. It looks good, but it leads to destruction. It makes you look so holy. Sister, what's your name? Praise the name of Jesus. Ooh, that I must speak at a word. Hallelujah. And then you go, sister, you know what? At the church, I met this guy. Finally, God sent me a godly man. You know what I'm saying? You don't need that. That's a Nimrod spirit right there. He got you. He will convince you that he's really holy when he's not really holy. But you fall for it. You melt like chocolate, huh? <laughs> and it's not good. So now you know when someone tells you, sister, you want a uh, coffee from the cafe? A, la a, a latte? <laughs> I want you to look at him like, whoa! Whoa! Uh, rebuke you, uh, you are malic type. Nimrod, Jezebel, Spirit in the name of Jesus. I'm waiting for my bow I don't need you. I don't need you. I don't need you. Whoa, 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 whoa. I bought my own coffee. <laughs> whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh -huh. A person with a Nimrod spirit will skillfully mix holy with the profane. Looks good, but it leads you to destruction. This spirit will build a kingdom based on confusion. Amen? Have you ever met somebody and then said, how's it going? Come on, confused. It's not a God. <laughs> That's confusion. Remember I just said that. Whoa. Anybody here have said, I don't know what to, say, to do. I'm like, I'm really confused. Really, be serious. Anybody facing that? It doesn't have to be a man or a woman. It could be a situation. Anybody facing a confusing situation? Raise your hand. Just be honest. Okay, it's not of God. Yeah, put your hands up. It's not of God. Now, if you want to be a Nimrod and be rebellious and be terrible, no, I know it's not God. God told me that you're a Nimrod. But if you're here sitting down and you're raising your hand and you're confused, God is not about confusion. He's about order. When it's of God, you will have no doubt. You will have no confusion. You will know when it's God because it was just... It, it, you know what it's got. Yeah. Amen? So don't confuse it. Don't confuse it. Just say, whoa, confusion, you're not of God. Because then you lose sleep and you're worried. Why are you worried? Why are you confused? Because I don't know. I mean, I really, really, what you really want. But God doesn't want you to really, really want it. It's not good for you right now. There's a pastor that said, you know what? I was shaving. And my son was next to me. He put on the shaving cream. And he saw me with a razor. But I didn't give him the razor. Because he said, this it's a blessing when he gets older, but it's harmful for him right now. He will cut himself. There's some things in your life that you want that is not good for you right now. It might be good for you later on. It might be a God thing, but at this time, it's confusing. It's not for you. It's going to hurt you. You're going to end up hurting, crying. How many people do I know that, that say they come for advice and I tell them they don't want to hear it, they do their own thing, and about three, four years later, <laughs> He was married. <laughs> I knew something about him. I'm broken. We'll go talk to Pastor Carlos and every told you last year. I don't have time for that. I don't have time. <laughs> Crazy. This, 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 whatever. Whoa, somebody say whoa, okay? <laughs> And, and, and I'm done here, this, this, this Nehemiah spirit, I just said earlier, is very convincing, and it will lead people to build the city towards heaven. 
that uh, Babel is, a, is, a, is, is something that Nimrod was doing, like a building. He wanted to build his own kingdom to get to heaven, and, and, and you can't do that. And it starts causing confusion and leads people away from God, and, and Nimrod's spirit is witchcraft, you know. Uh, if you ever hear someone like, man, I know that my marriage is going through what it's going through because I know my tia and so and so, she's in love with and she's cursing us now. That's a lie. Rebuke that. Ain't nobody got more power than your God. No one can separate what God puts together. No one can mess you up. No one can destroy you. When God says live, he means live. No one can tell you you're going to die. No one can curse what's already been blessed because God is on your side. Amen. Let's give it up for the Lord here tonight. Come on, pray in the name of Jesus. That's what you know. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I want you to just close your eyes, just you and God right there. And I want you to lift up your hands. Come on, all of you. Lift up your hands. This is a, this is a, Moses, a Moses time. And if it gets tiring, you know, if you're sitting next to him, just lift it up. And, but it, it won't take long. But this is a sign of victory. No part-time victory, my brother and sisters. Nothing but full-time victory. And if you've gone through some things, I, I, I actually missed a part of my sermon that said, why are we going back? I mean, we think about it, Joshua went back, back to Genesis. And I feel like, is, is God allowing us to go back at the part of the sun? Because we all need to come back to God. We all need to go back to Jesus. Even if it's like it's going backwards, it is actually going back to God. We can't get too ahead of God. What happens when we get too ahead of God? All hell breaks loose. We, can, we can't let us be in front and then look back at God behind us. No, God has to lead us. So with your hands lifted up, real quick, come on. Even if it's tiring, I want you to say this. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus forgive me forgive for anything and for all my sins. All I believe in you, Father. You're my God. You're my God. And devil, devil, you need to get away from my life. <laughs> Woe to you, devil. Woe to you. you got no power, no authority over my life. I have angels, I have angels. on either side of me. And when I get tired, when I get tired I, they will lift my hands up. So Father, tonight, I lift up my hands as a sign of surrender. I give you my entire life. On this journey that I'm on, have your way. Don't let me see evil as good. And don't let me see good as evil. I want nothing but greatness. I want that sweetness that lays right in front of me. The promised land that you promised me. And not only for me, but for the next generation. My family. Those that are lost. With my hands lifted up, I lift up my entire family to the heavens. That one day, those that are lost will be in this house praising your name as well. So Father, tonight, I want to say I love you. And I want to accept you, not halfway, not part-time. I want to accept you as my Lord and personal Savior, my Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai, my Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Father, have your way. I ask you all these things. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, amen. Thank you.